And now, the reason you're all here, uh, let me introduce today's speaker, Alexander Mika Birdze. Uh, he's a professor of history and uh, Ruth Herring Knoll Endowed Chair at Louisiana State University Shreveport. He has written and edited over two dozen books, including the award winning The Napoleonic Wars A Global History. <laughs> that's in my collection. And that's been translated into six languages. And he's one of the editors of the multi volume. Cambridge History of the Napoleonic Wars, and we had him about a year ago uh, talking about, about Kuts, Kutsov, so uh, that's a, another great book in, in my collection. So please join me in welcoming um, Alexander Mika Birdze. So I'll get out of the way, and this should be all yours, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, I do appreciate Tom uh, and Christopher uh, inviting me uh, again Um to the podcast, uh, well, I almost, almost said podcast because we were talking about a podcast, but uh, to the symposium, um, I guess I did some, you know, I, I did it right last time. So, um, and uh, I, it's always a pleasure to see a wonderful audience uh, like today. Um, when uh, Tom reached out to me um, gonna, and asked about participating uh, in, in, in his in symposium about this kind of overlooked figures, right? people's, people that are not Wellingtons or Napoleons. Um, I uh, came back with several several suggestions, uh, and one of them was uh, Cambaceré, because to me, he is one of those fascinating figures of history who are at, uh, at the heart of it, and yet um, not, not receiving the limelight that they deserve. Um, Cambaceré died in uh, on March 8, 1824. So his anniversary of his death is just around the corner. And I thought this will be especially kind of uh, opportune moment to um, kind of take the opportunity uh, to recall, to reassess, to evaluate his role during the revolution, the empire. Uh, and, and and maybe shift a little bit of limelight away from Napoleon uh, to 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 the man who stood uh, by him and and helped him achieve many of the things that we're gonna give him the sole credit for. Uh, now speaking of Napoleon, um, he his Minister of Treasury uh, Molien once commented. Let me see here. Uh, here it goes. Once commented that. The, the role of uh, the profession of a king was too easy for him. And he had also taken that, the role of the prime minister. Uh, well, in fact, um, Napoleon never really had a prime minister, right? He never had a formal prime minister or, not, or principal minister, as it was oftentimes in, in the case of the French monarchy. Um, people that surrounded him, whether in, in military uh, or or civil functions from the great dignitaries uh, to the uh, you know, state councillors or ministers, they were, for, in practical terms, clerks. Now, clerks in the, the best sense of this term, in this kind of noble sense of this word, uh, but clerks nonetheless, because Napoleon was the leader, right? He commanded them, he gave them orders, he supervised them, um, and I think oftentimes we kind of see this system as utterly kind of uh, uh, hierarchical and vertical, uh, uh, kind of vertically integrated with one man at the top. But once we start scratching uh, a bit more kind of around Napoleon, then you see that he's surrounded by a group of close confidants. And in this assembly, uh, to me, one man stands out um, by you know, said that by the proximity to the power, uh, by the uh, sheer talents that he had, but also by the confidence that he inspired and was given by uh, the likes of Napoleon. And that one person is Jean-Jacques Régis de Capacere. Here we are dealing with a clever, uh, in intelligent, uh, clever, uh, patient, ambitious, uh, experienced, um, prudent, yet imaginative uh, man who on one hand represented some of the best of the old regime, the Ancien regime, as well as the 
changes that the revolution brought about and certainly stood for the imperial consolidation of the revolutionary legacy. Here we're dealing with a tireless worker who nonetheless, and this is, I think, one of the key elements in, in this story is that a tireless worker who nevertheless took time to enjoy life. Here we are looking at an accomplished politician uh, who was also one of the brightest legal minds of this time. And as I started in the, in the first slide, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the quote is from a wonderful French historian, Pierre-Francois Pinot, who in his uh, uh, biography of, of Cambaceres famously uh, point, uh, notes that for 15 years, Cambaceres was more than number two and less than number one. And I love that kind of ambiguity of it, that he's certainly not wielding as much power as Napoleon, but on the other hand, there is no one like him around Napoleon. So and we'll talk about this. Uh, and the one more point before I kind of uh, uh, start um, discussing his, his life. Of course, the title of the of, of this presentation comes from I. Sir Wallach's wonderful chapter in his Napoleon and his collaborators, which deals with Cambaceres. And that title, title uh, uh, the chapter is entitled The Second Most Important Man in France, which I thought echoed again Pinot's assessment and put Cambaceres in, in, in this unique category of a, of a one kind person, one you know, unique person in, in Napoleonic France. And, and as we go, actually, and I'll, I'll kind of go back to this point, but one of the things that makes Cambaceres unique is that he is the rare example of an individual who is shown next to Napoleon as an equal. And what I mean by that is kind of size-wise, perspective-wise, he is oftentimes shown on, on the contemporary prince as next to Napoleon and of the same stature. And, uh, now, granted, most of those portrayals are uh, kind of critical or negative portrayals, both French and German and British uh, uh, prince uh, of, of Napoleon Cambaceres, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, it gives him that kind of agency. All right. Um, Let's look at his early life. All right. Um, Jacques, uh, Jean Jacques was the son of, uh, um, of a prominent counselor, uh, jurist, one time mayor of Montpellier. So he was born in October uh, 18, 1753, into a, a, a well established noble family, which would have been uh, quite prominent in Montpellier affairs, so in south of France. Uh, the family has been in legal service for quite some time and produced generations of magistrates. Uh, Jean-Jacques' own father, the, whose portrait you see on the screen, Jean-Antoine, was one of these kind of esteemed members of the uh, extended Rambassera family, uh, was a talented lawyer, uh, became a, a mayor, um, and um, you know was successfully married uh, to a wonderful woman by the name of uh, marie Rosé. Uh, with whom he had 11 children. But out of those 11 children, only two actually survived the infancy, the childhood, and these uh, these two are Jean-Jacques himself and his brother, Etienne Hubert, uh, who, by the way, Etienne Hubert will go on and become uh, a senior official in uh, or senior uh, you know, official in, in the French Catholic Church, uh, rising all the way to the position of the archbishop and cardinal. Certainly his brother helped, but uh, Etienne Hubert uh, was, a, was a capable man uh, uh, of his own. Um, the, I mean, having 11 children and then losing uh, nine of them, of course, it's, it's a family tragedy, right? And of course, it, it was a uh, rather uh, uh, demanding on, on the health of Marie-Rosé who died um, by the time Jean-Jacques was 16 years old. So his father eventually remarried um, and uh, had two more children, uh, one of whom, a, a girl and, and a boy, and, and the boy would ultimately become uh, a general, actually, in the in the French army, Hubert Cambaceres. So if you come across him, 
uh, that's uh, a, a, a stepbrother, uh, right, or half brother of, of Jean Jacques. Um, he's, I, I think, in many respects, Jean, Jean Jacques was um, predestined to go into the legal service, right? His family has been so deeply invested in in the legal profession. Uh, and, and there was, of course, the career avenue already open for him since his father was a counsel at the local um, uh, court and uh, had kind of the established pathway for his for his children. Uh, so um, Jean-Jacques was sent to study law. He, he successfully did so at the uh, Collège Bourbon in Aix-en-Provence. And then um, after finishing his legal studies, came back to Montpellier and joined his father's uh, uh, law firm. So he uh, he worked with his father for a time, um, then effectively inherited his father's position at the local uh, court and began his uh, career as a magistrate. And so here we see then as the young man, right? If you talk about his early influence, here we see uh, a young man who comes from the service nobility, right? That's what the Cambaceres are. They are not the main line of the Cambaceres. There is uh, several branches. In fact, uh, this line is a cadet branch of the wide, uh, of the larger Cambaceres family, uh, more impoverished than, than the main one and always kind of the poor cousins of the main Cambaceres line. In fact, that creates an interesting moment when later on when Cambaceres are, is kind of riding high, he would come back to Montpellier and kind of look at the wonderful building uh, that was still is known as Hotel de Campasere. And he will say, oh, you know, they kind of reminisce about his family, all, you know, having good times here. Well, that his family never owned it. It was the main branch of Campasere's who owned the building. Um, uh, if you note on the screen, I, I, I shared uh, an interesting tidbit from the, the baptismal record of Campasere. It's from a local church, uh, and where the the priest uh, noted that in the year 1753, on uh, 20th of October, uh, he baptized Jean Jacques Regis, born on the 18th of the same month, the legitimate and natural son of uh, Jean Antoine and his wife. But what the life, uh, what I find particularly fascinating is the last part of that uh, of that quote, and that is the godfather Charles Boyer and godmother Jean Temple both being children of the local orphanage. Right? Uh, Hospital General is not just a hospital, but an orphanage. So uh, they could not sign the document and therefore the father um, had to do it instead. And here I think you see kind of the, the family positioning itself from the very beginning, right? The Jean-Jacques at both as a, as a future lawyer or magistrate, as a future kind of representative of this noble family, but the family that is deeply in, engaged with the local community to the degree that the godfather and the godmother are actually local orphans who can't read and write, and they, they are the beneficiaries of the family largesse. Um, yes, let's stay just for a second. Um, and so he grew up in Montpellier, so working here um, uh, as, as a magistrate. And I think it is at this point that he gains uh, several life lessons uh, that he will retain for the rest of his life. And uh, it is also during this period, right, when he's in his late teens, early 20s, um, when he develops certain qualities, um, certain qualities of character that certainly come handy in, uh, later, uh, later in life. Um, one is the prudence, and for which he will be known throughout his career. Um, prudence, uh, kind of methodical approach, down to earth, uh, rational. M I think one of the key reasons for this was him facing or witnessing what happens to his father. So his father uh, mismanaged the uh, uh, family's financial holdings. Uh, he got himself embroiled in in a, in a uh, um, conflict with the local intendant for which he would be actually thrown out of the town hall of Montpellier. So his father, um, after successful career, effectively mismanages this by poor decisions, both in terms of finances and uh, 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 politics. And ultimately, Jean-Jacques actually will have to bail out his father and pay off his debts down the road. So the example of his father would have been something that 
uh, he would have borne in mind, how, what things not to do. Another important lesson that he, of course, would have been exposed at this age was the importance of networks or the importance of networking. And we've talked about the importance of in-person conferences for that very reason uh, before the before the start of this uh, 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 talk. And 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 Kambasare understood how crucial it is to maintain, to develop, uh, cultivate, nurture, and maintain the solid networks. And it is one. It is. I think one of the reasons why he will join Freemasonry and he will become very active me member of, of this society. Um, another and kind of third important lesson is what happens while he is kind of in, in Montelia. This is, think about 1770s, 1780s. This is a period in French history of attempted reforms, you know, Turgot, Mopo, and, and so on. And I think what it taught the failure, I think, of these reforms, what it taught uh, uh, Kambasere was to have a tasteful reform, but reform without abruptness, uh, to have the kind of reasonable uh, support for new, fresh ideas, but also uh, a measured expectation of the extent to which the reforms can be implemented all at once or at, at a quick pace. And so if things had stayed the way kind of they seem they would, then Cambaceres would have been just another local magistrate in Montpellier who would, who would have uh, maybe contributed to his uh, family's kind of continued success in local politics, but otherwise would have been unexception, uh, not, not, not exceptional or uh, unique. Revolution, of course, changes all of it. Um, the revolution breaks out in 1789. Uh, Cambaceré welcomes it because he sees the need for a certain change, a certain change, um, but um, uh, but certainly he doesn't, you know, envisions any radical transformations. He stands for elections into the general uh, general estates in in the spring, in the winter and spring of 1789, but he's unable to get to become the main representative of the local no, uh, uh, noble. Uh, or, or second estate, uh, he is designated as the ex, uh, ex, uh, as a supernumerary or extra deputy, uh, which were kind of chosen in addition to the 300 deputies that they were supposed to be sent to the general estate. As it was, um, the main deputy never got sick, so <laughs> Kambasara never made it to, uh, to Versailles. But um, he, he became engaged in local politics. He got kind of, you know, excited about it. Uh, he got elected as the head of the uh, of the uh, criminal tribunal that was set up um, once the revolution picked up steam, right in the fall of eighty nine and seventeen ninety. Um, he uh, was involved in the judicial kind of affairs on the on, in, in, in down in south of France. Um, but again, he would be he would have stayed a local figure until the decisive moment of the seventeen ninety two. The collapse of or the overthrow of the monarchy in August of seventy two, the the start of the war, uh, the the calling of the uh, national convention, um, Kamasare again runs um, in in uh, kind of puts his candidacy out for the deputy to the national convention, and this time he is chosen. He's he has won the election, and he would be sent to represent the uh, département of Hero. Uh, in, in the fall of 1792, thereby taking seat in the National Convention. And so this is where you have we have to look at him, right, uh, as a what kind of person would have prevailed in this kind of election cycle of 1792. First thing, of course, to remark is that he, even though he's a nobleman, he's not in a rush to leave the country. Um, he is uh, willing to participate in political process, which indicates his uh, moderation, his political awakening, and in seventeen in the fall of seventeen ninety two, we see him uh, as the center left figure, right? So he favors certain reforms. Uh, he certainly wants legislative uh, and judicial reforms, uh, and 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 that's why he's kind of uh, involved in in, in politics. Um, but um, he's. His willingness to kind of, or he actually his expectation or, or, or aspiration to become 
uh, Minister of Justice are dashed when the Girondins refuse to consider his candidacy. And instead, uh, it is Georges Danton who becomes the Minister of Justice and then replaced by Dominique uh, Garat. Um, uh, and so maybe partly because of this relationship with Girondins and kind of his um, uh, disappointment, or because of their willingness to kind of support more radical ideas, we see uh, uh, um, uh, Cambaceret kind of distancing himself away from Girondins. And, and that becomes especially clear during the um, trial of, of the king. We know in the fall of 1792, the king is put on trial. And I think no other event of his life forced Cambaceret to do so much arm twisting, so much vacillating uh, as, as this crucial moment. Uh, and we see that through how he tried to navigate really this revolutionary politics, because on one hand, he initially offers his legal advice that the convention lacks legal standing to even prosecute the king. Uh, yet, ultimately, the convention rules that it can. So Cambaceret needs to go back and kind of adjust his position. So he decides to then vote to convict the king. But uh, at the same time, he refused to support the motion that would have put the final fate of the king to popular plebiscite. Uh, then he kind of comes to sense that maybe he kind of weird too much to the right. So he votes for uh, death penalty for the king, but with qualification that only France is invaded. Only, but then again, he changes his mind and votes for the execution only then to vote for the state of it. So essentially, you see a person who vacillates constantly to find this middle path between the extreme of left and right. Uh, but in doing so, he factually uh, cast these equivocal votes that haunt him for the rest of his life. The fact that he casted his vote for the death penalty of the key for the king meant that he would be forever branded as regicide in the eyes of the royalists and ultimately down the road when everything comes crashing down he will be indeed prosecuted as such uh, but it also he's here where i find that you know figure like him is so fascinating it, you know he is not danton he's not robespierre he's not brousseau he's not these these out out and about great figures of revolution he's not giving fiery speeches and yet he is um, not necessarily behind the curtains, right? He's net right next to the curtains, kind of pulling the you know pulling the pulling the strings, participating, making his votes votes that matter, right? Uh, and, and somehow positioning himself in such a way that he's neither branded as royalist nor he's branded as Jacobin, right? So he he finds himself uh, in this moderate position, which is. Knowing what's going, you know, what's happening in France at this time is it takes a lot of skill. Above everything else, above everything else, what um, what happens? And I have this wonderful um, you know, li li uh, illustration of the uh, contemporary illustration of the execution of the king. But what happens uh, is that even with all this stigma that of, of being regicide. Um, one thing that stood out for him and one thing that really helped Cambaceret was uh, his expertise, his ability to understand legal matters, his willingness to work hard. And so he remains in national convention as the uh, point man, really, for all issues of legislation, or especially a legal one. Uh, and, and so he continues to work within the national convention through the spring of 1794. As, as a, uh, as a uh, capable and talented uh, legal mind. Um, we don't exactly have his response to the Thermidor and the downfall of Robespierre, but uh, two things can be said. One is he was, you know, knowing his moderation, we, you know, he would not, he was not a supporter of terror and he would have certainly welcomed the fall of that, of the terror system. Uh, but we also know that the fall of Robespierre didn't uh, didn't do him much harm so to Robespierre, uh, to the Cambaceret, uh, which means that he was never really close to to the ruling party. Uh, in fact, uh, Rob uh, um, uh, Cambaceret survives terror largely unscathed, 
and unlike so many other right moderate deputies and he uh, joins the Thermidorian reaction continuing to work on legal issues in fact it is in the wake of terror when so many bright figures are either right exiled or have political careers demolished or really dozens and dozens of them executed right um Kambasare emerges as really the most capable one you know one of the most if not the most capable legal minds inside the uh the post-thermidorian government and so he is therefore given uh um, repeated assignments to work on the great issues dealing you know confronting revolution and therefore you see him as president of the committees for legislation or the public safety for the war for the general security um, he was the president of the entire national convention in uh, late 1794, post-Thermidor. So he is, I wouldn't, you know, he's in the front ranks of those who are shaping the French domestic foreign policy at this time. Uh, and it is at this moment that he begins the process for which Napoleon, I think, ultimately takes a lion's share of credit, but... Uh, and you know, if this talk had accomplished anything, it's to shift some of it to Cambasaret. And they, uh, and I'm referring to the drafting of the civil code. Uh, he was actively involved in the draft in the uh, in the first drafting of the civil code, and uh, participated uh, in the draft. Uh, actually, served as a member of the drafting committee of the new constitution, which will be approved in 1795 and will create the government of the Directory. Indeed, in 1795, he will be elected to the Council of 500 uh, and will stay in the council once again as a, as a, a point man for all issues of legislative and legal uh, for the next year and a half until uh, he um, will be actually, gonna, uh, he will lose the elections of 1797, will not be able to re-elect it. And so um, after 1797, he kind of goes to his private legal practice. So he sets up a legal firm and provides consultation. Um, actually, it does pretty well. Um, we have his legal paper, oh, his financial private, private paper surviving. So you can actually trace the evolution, kind of the growth or the, kind of the financial improvement in his standing from earning just a few hundred uh, francs or livres a year to earning well over 20,000 livres as a result of his private practice by 1790s late 1790s um during the directory he um he was kind of uh, approached by emmanuel cs future uh, director the man who will organize the conspiracy that will uh, so epically backfire on him and it is through the cs's uh, help that Kambasare becomes the Minister of Justice in July of 1799. And uh, it is in that capacity that he will be, uh, I would say, participant, but with quotation mark, maybe a, a, a proviso next to participant, uh, a participant of the coup of 18 Brumaire. And when I say proviso, is that he participated in the coup largely by refraining from active, you know, actively resisting the coup. Uh, which is why when Bonaparte returns from Egypt and takes over the power in, in this military takeover, Cambaceré um, uh, once again, just like in Thermidor, or oh, like in Terror and Thermidor, manages to emerge out of this crisis with his reputation unscathed. Three weeks later, just three weeks later, he is part of the triumvirate that takes over the government in France. So that's really, to me, uh, is, is a stunning kind of uh, uh, development. Um, why? Right? This is, will be, I think, the question some, some of your listeners will ask. Why would Napoleon choose Cambasere uh, as his running mate, right? So, to, you know, using the American, uh, American parlance, political um, I think this is a question of skills. It's the question of uh, Cambaceres's tact, his ability to consistently maintain good networking. Uh, it's certainly it's uh, it's the question of his remarkable legal expertise, his legislative experience, and I think 
a very keen understanding on part of Cambasere who Bonaparte was, what kind of leader he would be, right? Um, so this is where I think uh, Cambasere manages to do things that others could not because they were temperament wise, character wise, aspirationally wise, uh, incompatible with Bonaparte. And so we have Bonaparte as the first consul. We have Lebron as the uh, uh, second consul, or oh, actually third consul, and he largely maintained the uh, kind of his domain was the financial affairs. And Cambaceres was the second consul dealing with the governance administration uh, and, and legislative uh, uh, issues. Um, he will have a remarkably successful run in, in, in this position, both as a second consul until 1804, and then from 1804 forward as the arch chancellor of the empire. Um, it is as the second consul and the arch chancellor that Cambaceres really becomes the shadow of Napoleon, that he uh, supervises uh, the drafting of the legislative uh, of legislation. He runs effectively runs the consular and imperial government whenever Napoleon is not around, which is a, a remarkable task, a remarkable role to fulfill, um, pointing to Napoleon's great trust in this man. Um, he uh, and, and again, that's a throughout the consulate and the empire. So this is a, a stretch of about uh, fourteen years that uh, Cambacere is the point man for. Or taking over the government when um, Bonaparte uh, was absent. Um, it is Cambaceres who supervises, who manages, and leads the third uh, effort to draft the legal code, the famous civil code of, of France. In fact, oftentimes we're forgetting that in addition to, five, uh, to the civil code, we have four other major codes, including the penal and uh, 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 code and the criminal code, all, all of which uh, Cambaceres presided over and, and chaired and, and contributed to, to far to a greater degree than Napoleon did, which is one of the reasons why if we look at the Cambaceres' code of arms, imperial code of arms, which is that second, uh, the middle uh, shield, uh, uh, along with imperial, uh, Napoleon's imperial code of arms, you see that the Cambaceres code of arms has the drafting, right? The legal kind of the hand of a magistrate holding the legal tablets is a very sim symbol of who he is. And, and I, I really find it very appropriate. All right, um, let me keep moving. So um, to me, Cambaceres therefore is one of the most important collaborator of Napoleon. Um, I'm using, and if I can go back quickly, I'm using here a quote from um, Isaac Warlock, uh, who speaks about punctilious administ administrative skills that um, Cambaceres has, poise and disdain for intrigue. And I think to me, this is one of the crucial points because that point uh, uh, shows Cambaceres in a better light than the likes of Talleyrand and Fouché. Right, the poise and disdain for intrigue, his moderate inclinations, his commitment to legal norms. Now that is a point that I will kind of talk about in a, in a second, and then most crucially, his prudent manner and kind of uh, uh, um, approach to how you deal with the uh, emperor himself. And I love this. Uh, this is a, a early uh, early nineteenth century, almost contemporary. Uh, print, and it shows Cambacere, and look at him nonchalantly, right, sitting there, kind of talking to Napoleon about how they can circumvent the legal, the uh, the existing legal um, system, and find loophole to proclaim the empire. I, I really like that 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 uh, uh, that screen. And notice uh, Napoleon's uh, brothers are standing, uh, Joseph and Lucien are standing. Napoleon is seated. And Cambaceres is sitting. And this is where kind of echoing what I've said in the beginning, Cambaceres effectively is on the on the equal footing with Napoleon. And same kind of to continue that um, line of thought, thought, even in terms of 
caricatures and prints, other kinds of prints, Cambaceres oftentimes is shown as equal to Napoleon. Um, uh, and, and you see here, for example, Cambaceres on this print entitled the Corsican Minotaur, uh, effectively supplying the resources to the Minotaur that devours it. In this case, this is the conscription. And if you look at the plates that were already devoured, this is the money and men that Cambaceres effectively supervised the administrative system that keeps feeding Napoleon, this monster. Um, let me move here. So I, I want to you know, spend a little bit of time on, on Cambaceres as the character, right? On one hand, Cambaceres, kind of at the end of his life, and certainly not unlike Napoleon, uh, says that he's, he, I've lived my life in the faith of the Catholic Apostolic Church. Napoleon says the same thing, right, in his last will um, on St. Helena. Uh, but you cannot but take that with a, a large grain of salt. Because alongside religious traditionalism that we see in, uh, I think, both men, Napoleon and Cambaceres, we also see their lifelong commitment to free thinking. And in case of Cambaceres, to Freemasonry, in which he was a senior member, unlike Napoleon, there is no indication that Napoleon himself was the Freemason, though his brothers were, and certainly many people around him like Cambaceres were. Character-wise, I cannot but value, and then uh, to a great degree, his deep knowledge of law, his careful attention to detail, right? Running these massive imperial structures, especially at the height of empire in 1807, 1808, 1809, it required a superb uh, uh, mind like Cambaceres who pays attention to details. His remarkable aptitude for hard work. Napoleon was notorious hard work, you know, workaholic. Cambaceres uh, was, uh, was equally uh, uh, committed to hard work. And the fact that he was consistently not an ideologue, not in I, you know, a person driven by some kind of ideals, uh, or you know, uh, or, you know, that oftentimes lead to utopianism, right? The aspirations, but rather a realist who un, who had a good sense of what is possible. Now, that of course, that realism oftentimes uh, could be misinterpreted as an opportunism, and certainly during the terror, during the Thermidorian reaction, during the coup of 18th Brumaire. Uh, Cambaceres demonstrates pragmatism that borders on opportunism. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I think one of the, his biographers kind of speaks about uh, Cambaceres as the man for all season of revolution, right? Because he, he has that sense of realism and adaptability. Uh, one of his contemporaries, actually a person who knew him well, right? He uh, uh, notes in, in, a, in a memoir, that Cambaceres by nature was governed more by prudence than by courage. And that approach served him very well during revolution. And that's the approach that will be demonstrated by him throughout the consulate and the empire. But here's the kind of the other side of the coin, right? Is that Cambaceres constantly had to tread the fine line between his commitment to law his love for the rule of law, right? He Here is the lifelong student of law. So that's on one side. But on the other hand, he needs to deal with the needs of the emperor. Emperor who oftentimes wants to tread on this law and find loopholes around it. And so one of the contemporaries, for example, um, noted that, that no one could employ greater knowledge or skill to justify with legal forms the acts of sheer power and give the appearance of legality to Napoleon's illegalities. Right? And that's where I think I see a, a crucial role for Cambaceres. This is factual, not only to manage the government, not only to supervise these imperial structures, but also to provide this nuance, legal opinion, or political opinion to Napoleon. And oftentimes that opinion was designed, as, as it's uh, noted here, to justify the acts of illegality. So, 
Another interesting element about him is that he was notoriously vain person. And I think Napoleon exploited that. I remind you that expression that Napoleon had that men are led by baubles, right? Um, well, uh, Cambaceres was the, 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 the glutton for that. <laughs> he, he loved um, all these recognitions and social distinctions. Uh, one of the contemporaries notes that never did titles, crosses, and rebounds give anyone more pleasure than they did for Cambaceres. His whole delight lay in displaying and wearing them. And all, that's why on the prints that you will see in, in, in the second, he's oftentimes shown is in these ostentatious dresses, but also wearing his regalias and, and uh, 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 distinctions. Um, Thomas Ress has a uh, kind of para <coughs> uh, paradoxical kind of part of him is that on one hand, he's very careful with money. And again, I mentioned that his financial receipts, kind of financial papers survive, so we can actually reconstruct much of his uh, uh, financial well-being. We know, for example, that um, for almost all of his adult life, he was consistently saving half of his income, which is a remarkable thing to do. We all know how hard that is, right? To set aside almost half of your income for the uh, uh, for a later day. Um, so he was very kind of careful with money, good manager. And yet, and yet, here's the man that contemporaries accused of all the extravagance, all the luxury. I love the expression of gastronomic profigality or prodigality for uh, uh, that he uh, or, or kind of demonstrated. He was notorious for organizing it on every Thursday, big dinners for 50, 60 people. He was notorious for his kind of being a connoisseur of good food, good uh, entertainment, good wine, uh, on which he spent a, a really enormous sums. In fact, by 1811, he's spending well over 100,000 francs a year just on, on food and, and drinks. And, and this, to give you kind of, to put it in the context, uh, a, a general's, a general's uh, uh, annual income is, is about 10 to 12,000 francs at this time. So this is a, an astonishing uh, sum for, for him to spend. Um, uh, and then there was this issue of petit default. Now that's a, kind of a very subtle issue. Um, it is an issue of, of, of um, okay, petit default is a term that in the 19th century was referring to, to the social deviancy. Uh, and in case of uh, Cambaceres, we kind of see contemporaries uh, uh, talking about his uh, proclivity towards young men. Now, we don't have direct evidence for um, Cambaceres is kind of overt homosexuality, right? Um, and the reason I'm saying direct evidence is, for example, um, there is a remarkable guy by the name of Favier. Uh, if you, you know, I suggest you know, your listeners can read the secret correspondence of Favier with Napoleon. He was a really influential kind of counsel and advisor to Napoleon. Uh, well, Favier was um, uh, openly homosexual, uh, was actually openly living with his partner. Um, Cambaceres is not like this. He has no partner, as far as we know. Um, he all his life he lived kind of this overtly celibate life. Uh, Napoleon certainly uh, teased him for that. Cambaceres is the uh, subject of numerous jibes and countless caricatures, as you will see in a second. Uh, Napoleon, in fact, at one point uh, urges Cambaceres to kind of. Um, you know, take, you know, ha have a woman in his life, right? Kind of put up an appearance. And Cambaceres uh, famously uh, takes, kind of goes with a, one of the charming ladies to the theater, and, but then he makes himself look ridiculous because uh, as contemporaries remark, he didn't, he didn't know how to kind of act with a woman uh, and, and what kind of compliments, you know, to, to, to offer her and, and so on. Um, but the one thing is that this petit default, even though it's subject of, of caricatures and so on, 
uh, it clearly did not affect Cambaceres's career. That Napoleon did not care what Cambaceres was doing in the privacy of his home. He valued Cambaceres who, for who he was as a, a uh, as an expert, as a thinker, as, a, as an individual who could advise and contribute. And so here's kind of a series of contemporary prints that I want to show you. Um, you see here the seller of ridiculous things, right? And it kind of tie, ties in with Cambaceres' penchant for wearing a suspicious clothing and all the regalia. I'll, this is, I think, my favorite one. Uh, I think your listeners are familiar with the uh, Jacques-Louis David's famous Oath of Horaci, right? Well, this is the Oath of the Voracious. <laughs> How is it? Cambaceres, right? And his, uh, uh, I guess, uh, good old buddies pledging their oath to, to be uh, gluttonous and uh, have good food and, uh, uh, and drinks. And yet another one, right? Cambosere leading the gluttonous procession. I love the turkey, <laughs> the plates. <laughs> um, I think this one is, again, one of those really vicious ones, right? Uh, you see Cambosere's, notice in all of these caricatures, he's shown as a stocky, plumpy, short guy. In fact, uh, the name itself, Cambosere, comes from a Languedoc, um, uh, area and it refers to stocky person, which was again a, a doubly a, a double play here, uh, because if you look at the portraits of of Cambacere as such, he actually uh, was shown as the kind of tall, you know, of, of, not I would say tall, but certainly of normal height and plumpy, but nothing unusual certainly. But the caricatures tended to make him out uh, uh, to look fatter than he actually was. And I think this particular caricature is, is quite devastating, uh, both by uh, underscoring his penchant for uh, ancien regime clothing, his love for all the kind of orders and, and regalia, but also his gluttony with that pig, uh, right, <laughs> standing behind him uh, with the, with the uh, fork. Um, Cambaceres' uh, homosexuality was also a subject of widespread ridicule and, and prints. He was um, nicknamed Tante Urluret. Ur 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 and here you see kind of him as a, as a cro in a cross dress. And what, notice right here uh, the, uh, the man purse <laughs> that he is, is carrying. He, uh, the inscription is the hate of the women. And I think that becomes kind of an important refrain in the critical views of Cambaceres, that he's not only kind of the threat because politically he's so close to Napoleon, he's so influential. He, in Napoleon's absence, he's in charge of the government administration, but also he represents unnaturalness, right? Deviation. Uh, and in fact, uh, let me see if I have a couple of prints here. Yes, there you go. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I like this prints particularly because these are the prints that talk about the end of the world. And the end of the world comes in two ways. One is Napoleon destroying it, right, in terms of killing people, bringing the misery uh, and, and death. But it also ends because of unnaturalness and devi deviance of uh, Cambaceres. In fact, if you see here, right, Cambaceres stands, uh, you know, kind of with his back towards women. So he is rejecting the natural, right? In fact, to make this point even stronger, uh, right here, right here is a, once again, Cambaceres and Napoleon. Napoleon associated with the war and destruction. But underneath Cambaceres is a Latin inscription that says, the end of the world because he rejects nature and natural procre procreation. In fact, to make, you know, to reinforce that notion here is the, uh, if actually Cambaceres smashing the statue of a woman. Okay. Um, at the height of the empire, at the height of the empire, Cambaceres uh, was unrivaled in terms of his access to the emperor and his influence. I love this quote from Jean-Antoine Chaptal. 
uh, who by in, you know, in turn was a, a senior uh, um, figure in, in Napoleonic regime, in Napoleonic imperial government. And Chaptal, who knew Cambasares very well, they, they, they go, they went back to the early years of their life and, 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 and stayed close. He says, the only two people who succeeded in mitigating Bonaparte's angers were Cambasares and Josephine. And Cambasares right, never attempted to confront, contradict Napoleon's impetuous character directly. And once again, that subtlety that the Cambasares shows here, the understanding of who he deals with. So instead of confronting right, the Napoleon's care in petriosity directly, Cambasares would usually give Napoleon's fury a chance to develop fully. He would give him time to dictate the most iniquitous decrees. He prudently waited for the moment when the temper had spent itself without constraint. And only then Cambasares would then effectively say, uh, are you done now? <laughs> right? And he will offer thoughtful reflections. And if, even if he didn't always succeed in getting the measure in question revoked, he frequently managed to soften it. And so Chaptal then concludes, I have often admired the calm and the skill of Cambasares in such matters, and several times I've seen him ward off great misfortunes. Let me read another really fascinating uh, um, kind of character study of Cambasares by uh, Alphonse Lamartine, the great poet, the great political figure uh, in the post-Napoleonic era. And so here's what uh, uh, Lamartine wrote about Cambasaray. So he says, uh, Bonaparte esteemed his capacity and feared nothing from his courage. I think that's a, once again, important point to make. No one knew better than Cambasaray how to conform himself to second-class duties. He therefore removed all the jealousy from first-rate actors. Napoleon had elevated him as high as he, as he possibly could with the, without fearing him too near approach. Subordination of character on the part of Cambasares played the game of flattery. There was something of the Alcibiades grown old in this prince. He was arch-chancellor of the empire, a sort of civil viceroy whom the sovereign left at Paris during his distant campaigns to represent him at the head of the Council of State, to be answerable to him for all of France. Cambasares affected some ridiculous peculiarities by way of, of pledges to the emperor. A man thus making himself a butt of ridiculous, or, or kind of ridicule at the court and the laughter of people might be useful, but he could never be dangerous. Cambasares accepted it. And he even seemed to look for this ridicule. He walked every evening in the old court, in the ancien regime costume, accompanied by two, two grotesque chamberlains with head bare, periwig, powdered, like all our old uh, grandfathers in the galleries of Palais Royal. Women of the town, children, and strangers followed this group with gaze and gawking and hooting. Cambasares, sought for the celebrities of Apicius. He exacted etiquette, obeisance, and titles from the old aristocracies around him. He was superannuated genius of ceremonial in a monarchy of upstairs, of, of, of upstarts. He was an essay on the costumes of the empire. And yet, Cambasares was laughed at, but he was respected and esteemed. And I love that paradox, laughed at, but he was esteemed. He was the arch chancellor of the empire. He was an, as long as the empire lasted. It is Cambasares who is the point person for Napoleon's relationship with the Senate, with the Council of State, with the legislative core. It is Cambasares, for example, who manages to soften the blow of, of Napoleon on the tribunal in 1807 purge. I mean, Napoleon wanted to be much harsher on tribunal than he was as a result of uh, Cambasares' involvement. As an art chancellor, Cambasares had a well-defined constitutional role. He received the oath, participated in the development of laws and the Senate, Senatus Consulta, presided over numerous bodies of legislative process. He retained major political role throughout the empire. 
He was always consulted by the emperor. In fact, um, this is one of the fascinating things. Uh, um, Cambaceres wrote um, almost every week, usually biweekly, but almost, you know, oftentimes every week, to Napoleon, these long reports of what was happening in France in Napoleon's absence. Um, and that correspondence disappeared in 1815. And so if you read all biographies of Cambaceres, especially by uh, Pierre Vial, you see historians kind of uh, bemoaning the fact that that treasure was gone. That it, you know, it, was a, it would have offered us a remarkable insight. But guess what? 150 years later, <laughs> in late 1960s, um, this treasure trove of documents, some 1,400 letters that Cambaceres wrote to Napoleon, covering the entirety of um, uh, uh, consulate and empire, with exception of a gap in 1812, well, that stash was found in private ownership, in private hands. Uh, then uh, the owner um, gave the this collection to the um, National Archives of France, and it was published uh, with a great editing by the eminent French historian Jean Toulard. And if we look at this correspondence, we see that in these uh, letters written in this perfect, you know, perfectly written French, uh, Cambaceres offers realist assessment of the situation in France. And he never hesitates to reveal things or reveal his thoughts on things, uh, identify solutions, but ultimately, and this is again the subtlety of him, ultimately leave the final decision in the hands of Napoleon. Right? He always extended his opinion by sketching out the solution, but expected the final say to come from Napoleon. Uh, when the empire collapsed in 1814, uh, Cambaceres, um, I love this print because it shows once again, Cambaceres kind of, it's a double entendre right here. Cambaceres sneaking out in the back door, but it also kind of allusion to his homosexuality, the back door. Uh, and so he's sneaking out there. Um, he retired to his private um, life um, in Spenso in 1814, um, um, you know, kind of enjoying life. Um, he was not particularly thrilled uh, by Napoleon's return in 1815. Uh, Napoleon really um, twisted his arm, or as, uh, as the French historian Thierry Lenz puts it, uh, he, pull, he essentially pulled his ears <laughs> and made him return back uh, as an arch chancellor of empire and the minister of justice in 1815. And uh, Cambaceres paid for that. Uh, he, um, when Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo and the Bourbons returned back to power, uh, 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 unlike the first time around, unlike in 1814, Cambaceres was proscribed and he was forced to go into uh, exile. So he settled in Belgium in the spring of 1816, then moved to Holland and uh, kind of spent the uh, next couple of years. Um, enjoying the free time he had by writing and by dictating memoirs. And those memoirs remain unpublished for 180 years until being released in a wonderful edition by uh, Perron in 1999. Now, those memoirs, um, I think it is kind of uh, frustrating. I would say they are frustrating. And they're frustrating because... Um, Cambaceres had plenty of time to draft these memoirs after 1815. Um, so he had careful kind of time to think over things. And he was very careful. I think we can have an expression of his moderation, an expression of his realism. He was careful not to reveal too much. All right. So we have, therefore, um, a, a, a bit of a dry maybe not monochromatic, but not, nonetheless, not, nonetheless, a dry chronicle of his time as art chancellor. But what is missing is that fun part of, of, of private life, of gossiping, of things that he's witnessed and overheard away from the public arena. And that, that part, I think, is missing. Still, it, it's, a, it's a valuable resource that we have. 
uh, partly making up for the lack of kind of rumors and, and juicy details. Uh, your listeners can uh, pick up uh, Lamoth uh, Langon's Evenings with Cambaceres. It's a multi-volume set of an individual who, after 1814, spent evenings with Cambaceres and kind of kept track of what Cambaceres said uh, each evening. And then they're quite fascinating for what they reveal about Cambaceres' thinking, his role, his interaction, and relations with people. Ultimately, he died on March 8, 1824, uh, largely forgotten by the contemporaries. There is very little reaction to his death. And he's buried at Père Lachaise in the 39th Division, if anyone would like to go and see this sepulchre where this esteemed man and, uh, man's remains still rely in repose. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, why don't you stop sharing your slides and we can see each other here. Um, there weren't a whole lot of questions and, and then we're kind of up against it time-wise. Was there anything you, you wanted to bring forward, Chris? Um, so I was just hoping to ask one sort of general question that I thought might um, might maybe encompass a lot of different themes. And uh, as Tom said, uh, there's, there weren't a lot of questions in the chat, but maybe this will... Uh, cover some that other people had. Um, so you mentioned several times um, his his moderation, uh, and even once you uh, you sort of said vacillation sort of early in the uh, early in the revolutionary period. And I don't think any of us or certainly probably you would would ever use the word uh, a weak or, or a weakness when describing him. But did any of his contemporaries see that as a weakness? Did they ever try to exploit that moderation or, or attack him because of that? Um, y yes or no, in that not necessarily a weakness, uh, in that uh, they all, irrespective of the uh, side, really, uh, both royalists and uh, you know Jacobins uh, during the revolution and later on those who supported the empire, you know, whether Republican-minded or royalist-minded, or, you know, they all appreciated what he had to offer. Now, moderation during the revolution carried the, the danger of being accused of being moderate. I mean, think about the, you know, the what was the downfall of Danton, right? He was accused of being, too, uh, of being moderate. Um, so there was a threat of being a, kind of being perceived too as too moderate and paying um, a price for it during the revolution. But, and, and, and I think, uh, Cambaceres is savvy enough to navigate the, terror, the politics of terror in such a way that he's never he's never really at the front line where he's so visible with his moderation, but he's also close enough to the centers of power, whether you know as a member of the national convention or the president of of this assembly or the committee member or you know president of different committee members responsible for immense tasks like drafting of the legal codes. So, the, uh, so I think this is where I see it uh, more than necessarily kind of a weakness. You know, and uh, I think on the Napoleon side during the empire, uh, Napoleon, you can say that he exploited Cambaceres' uh, willingness to kind of to submit himself, right? That that you can explain, you can look at some moderation. Uh, oh, okay, in moderation is also is a willingness to play a second fiddle. Um, uh, and but he understood how important it was to have individuals like this. So Cambaceres is on one hand vain, but he's not necessarily a politically ambitious person. That's different from um, Talleyrand, from Fouché, from really many any marshals or most of the marshals that you can kind of, uh, look at, uh, the likes of Bernadotte or the likes of Murat, and and that gave Cambaceres uh, the level of comfort that I think those other individuals lack because Napoleon continued to trust him. Even, to, even in 1812, uh, when uh, you have the conspiracy of Molay, uh, Molay uh, Napoleon chews Cambaceres out undeservedly. So Cambaceres actually uh, plays his hand properly and right during that conspiracy. 
you know, he, he manages to kind of uh, organize the resources in order to contain it. Um, but Napoleon still kind of chooses him out for it, but nonetheless, you know, the relationship aren't affected. Or um, interestingly, Napoleon's decision to marry, right, to divorce the uh, uh, Josephine and, and marry Marie, uh, Marie Louise. Well, it is Cambaceres, alongside with um, Cardinal Fesch, Napoleon's uncle, who are instrumental in securing the divorce document in circumvention of right of of the Pope, and it is uh, Cambaceres who actually kind of helps with the marriage of Austrian princes. Even though Cambaceres, if you if you read his papers, he was actually kind of concerned what will happen to his standing. He was not particularly kind of uh, he didn't particularly like Marie Louise, uh, but uh, Napoleon kind of re reassured him that he will stay. Uh, in you know, a, a, a key figure in, in imperial government. So, thank you. So, certainly a, a very fascinating character. I'm. Uh, I have to apologize to um, to those uh, uh, people posting. I think a couple of questions have come in just now, um, and I'm afraid we're uh, we're going to have to cut it off because, of course, Tom and I have to prepare for the next. Uh, talk, but I'm going to suggest maybe um, um, Alex is very uh, active on Twitter. Um, so if you're on Twitter, uh, maybe we can start a thread on uh, on his relationship with other uh, Napoleonic figures and marshals. Uh, might be an interesting discussion there as well. So I do apologize to anybody whose questions we didn't get to, but um, just before I turn it back over to Tom, uh, thank you so much. This was uh, like like Tom said, a uh, fascinating character that uh, we don't know nearly enough about and uh, really appreciate you opening that door for us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a wonderful rest of the symposium. And uh, again, thank you for organizing uh, these wonderful events. Uh, even if I'm not watching it live, I you know that I, you know, I watch them in recordings and always something new to learn. Thank you. Excellent. So we're back in less than an hour. So... Uh, Three o'clock Eastern time for our final talk of the day, Everett Rummage, better known as the voice and, and man behind the Age of Napoleon podcast, uh, an outstanding uh, historical podcast. And uh, I think just as it relates to this talk, it, it just feels like when I, I'm getting my arms around it and, and learning this period, then I discover there's so much I don't know. <laughs> I have to dig in deeper, but but that, that's what goes part and parcel with a, a love of history. So thank you, Alex. A wonderful presentation. Really appreciate uh, you joining us again. So.